Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, as people continue to filter in, I'll make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, a, a big thank you to everyone that um, helped out uh, for our Summerfest outreach yesterday. It was a great success. Um, I, I really appreciated, um, I saw a comment that somebody had made on a Facebook page in response to the outreach and this person wrote, I just have to say, it was really an awesome event. All of the volunteers were amazing. Every single person was fabulous. I just kept thinking about how refreshing it was that this event was not about money at all. I really could feel the spirit of love at work. A big thank you to all of the volunteers. So, you know, I thought that was just a wonderful, um, you know, unsolicited uh, feedback. Uh, for those of you that like numbers, um, we had uh, 184 people come to the registration table um, that were from outside of the church, plus all of our volunteers. We went through 256 hot dogs, so uh, that tells you something. Um, but it really was a, a wonderful event, and um, there were so many connections that were made, and people that were just reached out to. And, and, and so I just want to thank everybody for all of your diligent efforts to, to make that Summerfest uh, a success once again. A reminder about the mid-year giving statements. They are available for you to pick up and take home uh, with you. Um, a reminder that next Sunday we're going to have our testimony Sunday. So we're asking you to come prepared to share uh, something that's happened to you maybe in the last uh, year, maybe in the last few months of how God has been at work at your, in your life. And you know, sometimes God is at work in ways that it's not always happy ways, right? There are some times that, that, that God works in our lives through difficulties and yet his presence and his strength is with us. But, uh, but again, um, Randy will be moderating that time of, of sharing. So come prepared next week to share a praise, a concern, a celebration, whatever it is. Um, I hope that you will um, will share next week. Also a reminder about our Agape breakfast that's going to be coming up on September 22nd that we've been talking about. A uh, reminder that that Sunday's events will be different. 9.45, we're going to have an informal time of prayer and singing here uh, in the sanctuary. And then at 10.15, we'll start seating downstairs. At 10.30, we're going to have a light breakfast um, together. We're going to have a devotional time and also uh, a short church business meeting. And then we're going to close by having the Lord's Supper together. Uh, again, this is an opportunity for us to gather the people both from uh, this service and the later service to have fellowship and then to join together around the table of the Lord. So uh, this is something new that we're trying and I hope that you will uh, join us on Sunday, September the 22nd for that uh, event. Any other announcements for the good of the church family this morning? Yes. Terrific. Um, as you uh, may have seen in the announcements, uh, Janet Williams is going to be walking for Riverview Estates, the Baptist home of South Jersey, and is receiving sponsors. So if you would like to sponsor her as she walks for the home, um, there are sheets in the back that you can pick up or see Janet uh, before you leave today. Okay, thank you. Any others? And let's uh, take the next few moments to prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs>
Our call to worship is uh, printed in your bulletins, and uh, hopefully you can share. We, we ran a little bit short this morning because uh, the folding machine jammed, and then we forgot to make extra copies of the ones that jammed. So if you can share today, uh, our call to worship is responsive. We praise you, our God. We praise you, our God, for bringing your people from bondage to freedom and making them one body in Christ. We praise you, our God, for calling us to this place of prayer and our worship be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Amen. If you are able, I invite you to stand now as we sing our opening hymn, number 72, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Almighty God, we thank you that you are faithful to us. We stumble, we bumble, we fall, we get up, we fall again, and yet, Lord, you remain faithful to us. Thank you, Lord, for picking us up in the times that we could not pick ourselves up. And thank you for the grace that sustains us when days are long or nights are difficult. We praise you, we offer our thanks to you, and we ask, Lord, that you would help us to rededicate ourselves to you this day. We ask it all in the name of the one who makes it possible, Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
I invite you to join hands with the persons that are closest to you as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. First reading is 1 Samuel 23, 15 and 18. 1 Samuel 23, 15 and 18. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You will be the king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord. Then Jonathan went home, but David remained at Horash. And the second reading is the book of Hebrews, third chapter, 12 verse, 312 in Hebrews. See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ that we hold firmly till the end the confidence that we had at first. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Thank God for Continue our worship today with hymn number 443. I invite you once again, if you were able, to stand as we sing Trust and Obey.
hands and you may be seated. At this time, we joyfully receive your tithes and offerings. Invite the ushers to serve the people. Let us pray. Lord, whatever gift we bring, we offer it to you. So just as the widow gave her might, we give what we have. And we ask, Lord, that you would multiply it so that others may know about your love and your care through this community of faith. Bless gifts and givers today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please rise. To begin our time of sharing celebrations and concerns um, with a celebration that comes to us today from Matt and Kara Gehring, and I'm going to ask them to come forward at this time. As most of you know, they were at our International Ministries uh, Embrace the Call Conference at Green Lake, Wisconsin. Um, they are in the process of preparing to serve um, wherever God leads in uh, work perhaps God work, God's work in another country. So they're going to just share a little bit about their experience. So, um, last week we went to Green Lake Conference Center, which is the, Ameri the National Center for American Baptists. It's in Wisconsin. And um, Lee Spitzer, who's our regional executive pastor, um, was one of the key speakers. Going, Matt and I are resilient into going into this conference, and we weren't going to go because... We thought it was a conference for missionaries who were home on furlough, their year of rest. And we were like, yeah. And so we thought we were invited to kind of tag along and get any advice we could in this process. But when we got there, we realized it was 30 people that were invited and they were those who were seeking the call to become a missionary, hence embrace the call. So we were completely baffled when we got there because it was four people just like Matt and I who were in the process to become missionaries. Um, so we thank Pastor Eric and everybody else who kept telling us, you should go, you should go, you should go. And now we know why that they wanted us to go. So GDVA, um, Greater Delaware Valley Association, kindly paid our airfare. So we got to spend four days at Green Lake with 30 other people and other missionaries who they flew in from off the field to be with us to learn about every aspect of what it is to be a cross-culture missionary. So one of the things we can say that we're very thankful, I mean, we, we, like I said, Kara said we weren't sure what we were walking into. Um, even the first night we got there, well, we were shocked when we found out it was only about 30 people who were participating. We were kind of had this vision of this 
you know, 100, 200 people in a huge conference room kind of meeting, and it was this very intimate setting. Um, and uh, it was all focused on you know, embracing the call, embracing the cause, and figuring out um, where God's calling you. And uh, we kind of laughed because we got to meet a lot of people that weekend. Uh, you had a lot of intimate time meeting everyone, meeting a lot of different missionaries that were there, uh, some of the speakers that were there, people that were um, well established within American Baptist churches and international ministries. And it was great guy to spend a lot of time with these people. And it was interesting because generally the first question that each person asked was, well, what's your name? And then, well, where are you thinking of going? Or what are you thinking of doing? And we laughed because uh, I started saying, well, our first uh, real session was Saturday morning. And Lee, uh, Liz, Lee Spitzer uh, spoke Saturday morning, um, which anytime you get a chance to hear this man speak, listen to him. It's fantastic. Um, well, I, I would start telling people, well, at 9 o'clock in the morning, I would have told you that we're looking to go to Burkina Faso to be missionaries. We don't know what we're going to do, but we're going to go there. By 12 o'clock in the afternoon, I had no idea where we were going to go. No idea what we were going to do. God just spoke to us through these words in that time, opened us to a lot of what's been happening over the last months. Uh, Lee's book on determining your journey and figuring out these journey steps that God walks you through. And what we were able to do is look back and he, he really he told us that you never know you're in a journey until you're in the second step of the journey. Because the first step is preparation. And you never know what that preparation is until you look back on it and you see what God's been doing. And when we were able to look back, we were able to see all the things that God had been doing with us. And what we know now is that God is calling us to be missionaries. We don't know what that looks like. We don't know where it'll be. We don't know if it'll be overseas. We don't know if it'll be at home. We don't know what we'll be doing, but we know God is calling us. So we're a bit of the way through the process now. Carol will talk about that, um, but it's kind of interesting because we're about two thirds of the way through the process and now we get to start figuring out what we're gonna do. We don't know. God knows. So our next step in this process, because a lot of people have been asking, and we didn't know what the steps were. We were like, we keep just doing what they tell us to do, more paperwork, more evaluations, more conferences. Um, then when we got to the conference, they handed out a piece of paper that's the overview of all the steps. And we said, oh, this is really great to see. We're really far in this process. They said, you should have gotten that piece of paperwork with the first application. So we didn't get that piece of paperwork with the first application. So we were really like excited. And we were one of two couples who had even filled out an application. All the other people there hadn't even filled out an application. So we were like, whoa, this is mind blowing. So our next step is um, the last day in September and the first week in October, we are going to Ohio for three days of psychological evaluations, which is a little interesting, but they wanna make sure, I guess you're, yeah, it's a facility. I don't know what it looks like, I have no idea. We're just doing what they say. Um, and after that, there will be some more one-on-one -on -one interviews, and then we will be um, given the green light. Yes, you can serve under international ministries, or no, this isn't going to work. Um, so I'm thinking maybe on my time frame, December, I'd like to know. I don't know what they're going to decide. Um, so that's the next step. And we've just been trying to be obedient with what God wants us to do to take those steps. So that's what's happening next. And we just um, continue to ask you if you could refrain from posting anything on Facebook about this and talking to our little girl, Amelia, just because she's too young to know. And it's just not something we want on Facebook yet or anything. So I think that's about, about it. One, the last thing I will say is if anyone is ever considering a step in the mission field, if you have an opportunity to go to this event, uh, it seems like they're trying to do it annually, uh, this is an absolute. And it doesn't matter what we've learned is where in the process you are. Um, we've, well, the one thing that kept coming back from each person that was there was it was the perfect timing in their process to be at that conference which was awesome because everyone was at a completely different stage in the process. But God worked it to be the perfect time in that process, and it was for us. So if you ever are thinking or wanting to consider, and trust me, you're never too old. There was a woman there that was in her at least 70s who had an elderly mother she was caring for in her late 80s, 
and she was planning to go out. She was going out for three months at the end of this year and planning to go full time. So you'll never know when God will call you. Mm -hmm. Just be listening. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, guys. You know, uh, yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that I appreciate about uh, Matt and Kara is that they're really walking out the hymn that we just sang, Trust and Obey. Uh, they left not knowing exactly, having something in mind where they thought God wanted, but now being open to wherever God wants to have them serve. And you know, when we yield ourselves and are available, God will use us. Um, please be assured of our continued prayers through this process. It's very exciting for us as a church and also for our um, Greater Delaware Valley Association to be in the process of sending missionaries out from our association, which hasn't happened in quite a number of years. So it's a real joy, and we just continue to stand with you as you walk. The American Baptists were some of the first missionaries that had launched, and we're really lucky, the American Baptists. It was honoring to see just how the history is. Uh, and if you would like to know a little bit more about um, the history of American Baptist in missions, uh, the Judson, the Hopewell missionaries, um, there's a lot of really inspiring uh, work that God has done through our American Baptist family, and I just would encourage you uh, in that regard. Um, to close our concerns and celebrations time, I just want to ask if there are, if you would just call out um, any names of individuals that you would specifically like prayer for today. Gloria. Gloria, okay. Bonnie Self. Bonnie. Okay. Uh, old, I'm sorry. Lynn and Bob. Well, I uh, Walt and Linda Bruce, uh, as you know, they, they had a fire. I also want to pray for uh, the Adams family, uh, not the one on television, but uh, <laughs> the uh, Adams that uh, own Primo Water Rice. Uh, this is a co-worker, actually, of um, Liz Frawley. Um, they had a house fire and lost everything, so we want to pray for them. Uh, also, a uh, prayer request for Kiana Waite. Uh, continued prayers for Kay's brother, um, uh, Joe, as he recovers. Any others? Anna, yes, Anna Henry. Lisa. Pray for Lisa. Okay. Let's join our hearts together. Uh, Lord, we want to begin by thanking you for the wonderful experience that Matt and Kara were able to have. And all of those who are considering a cross-cultural mission service. We just pray for them as they continue the process, as they yield to whatever you wish, Lord. Um, and again, for all of those who are considering a similar call. Today we lift up specifically those who were named. We remember Anna Henry and Joe Merkel. We pray for Lisa and Mildred. We lift up Walt and Linda the Adams family, Kiana Waite, Lisa, Gloria, Bonnie, Lynn, and Bob. We also want to lift up all of our guests and visitors um, at the Summerfest yesterday. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to use us to reach out in love to others. For the others that are named uh, on our prayer list, but not whose names we have not spoken today, we just lift those individuals up to today, as well as any special concerns that are in the hearts and minds of those gathered here in this place today. Thank you, Lord, for listening and caring. Help us to be the answer to someone's prayer this week. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.
I'd like to continue today our service of worship with hymn number 473. If you would turn, stand, and join me in singing What a Friend We Have in Jesus, 473. morning I read from Acts the ninth chapter beginning at verse 19 B. Acts chapter 9 beginning at verse 19. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Christ. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord and had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, whenever we open your word, we are expectant, we are ready, to hear what you might speak to our hearts. So I ask today, as we open your word once again, that you would speak to our hearts and allow us to apply your word to the circumstances of our own lives. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning by telling you 
the story of a uh, former terrorist and a friend who helped change his life. But first, a little bit of background about this terrorist. And for the time being, I I'm going to leave the terrorist unnamed. But I, maybe if you are a, an avid reader, you might know the name of this person, and maybe you'll be able to figure it out along the way. But this particular man had been a terrorist for a number of years, and he hunted down members of the enemy group, kidnapping them and even killing them. He was well known and greatly feared. And then one day, something happened. The man had a change of heart that actually caused him to switch sides completely. And word on the street was that he was claiming to be a part of the very group that he was terrorizing. Um, and a rumor began to spread, and, and a message was passed along, a startling message that this man wanted to meet with the former, his former enemy's leaders. Um, and they were very skeptical. Was, was this a trick? Was this a trap? Um, could he be believed? Could he be trusted? Uh, was this just another one of his dirty, deadly tricks, this fox of a man? Uh, and one of the group's leaders, uh, or, or rather none of the group's leaders, wanted to take the risk to find out whether this man was really genuine or not, because everyone feared him. Can you guess who it is? Paul, the Apostle Paul. Saul, Saul of Tarsus, that was this man, the man who was a persecutor in the early church. Again, today we know him as Paul, but at that moment he was known as Saul, the person that became the very messenger to the Gentiles and to all of us. Uh, this was the terrorist, Paul. Interesting to think about it in that light, isn't it? To think he was, in fact, a terrorist. He terrorized the lives of so many people. Let me just back up a little bit farther and give you just a little bit more of the events that led up to the passage that I read here in Acts, the ninth chapter. Saul, or Paul, was on orders from the high priest to go to the city of Damascus, which was about 100 miles, so think from here maybe up to New York. He was traveling on that road to uh, Damascus. And he, of course, uh, in the famous story, is confronted by a bright light and a voice that speaks to him, which is Jesus. And he says, you know, uh, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he is blinded at that moment. And his companions heard this voice as well. And they uh, ended up taking him on to uh, Damascus, but he is totally blind from this incident and this bright light that came to him. And so his followers take him on to Damascus. He doesn't eat for three days, doesn't know what to do. This is, this is so impacted him. And then a man comes knocking at his door. His name was Ananias. Now, not the Ananias that we read about He's gone, right? the one that we read about a few chapters ago, right? This is a different Ananias, just like there are different names. There's, you know, John and this John and that John, just another Ananias. But this Ananias uh, came knocking at the door of the place where Paul was staying. And I say knocking because I think his knees were knocking together uh, when he came to the door. But God had spoken to him to go to this man. Go to this man that everyone feared. Go to this man that was killing and persecuting people that were following the way of Jesus. And God told him to restore his sight and to fill him with the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what Ananias does. He comes, he prays over Paul, something like scales fell off of his eyes. He could see again and he told him about this Jesus that Paul had seen on the road to Damascus. And shortly thereafter, Paul is baptized. And so Paul spends several days with the disciples in Damascus. He starts preaching 
in the synagogue to the surprise of everyone there, telling everyone that Jesus is the Son of God, that he is the promised Messiah, uh, and people can't believe it. They're like, this is the guy that has been causing havoc? This is the guy who had Stephen stoned? This is the same man they just were in utter disbelief. Wasn't he the one that terrorized and killed those who followed Jesus, and now he is proclaiming that very Jesus? Um, well, the leaders in the synagogues in Damascus were not very happy. They thought they were being sent reinforcements, and instead, now all of a sudden, Saul is doing, Paul is doing the opposite. And uh, in verse 23 of chapter 9, it says that after several days of this, they conspired to kill Paul. Paul catches wind of this, and then we hear the story about how his new friends um, waited for the right moment and lowered him in a big basket outside of the wall and snuck him out of the city so he would be protected. And he went on to Jerusalem uh, to meet some of the disciples there. Now, understandably, those people were deathly afraid of Paul. They did not know what had happened, right? This is the man that has been terrorizing everyone, wreaking havoc, it says, in that city. He comes back to that place, and nobody wants to meet with him. <laughs> They're afraid. Who, who wouldn't be? This is the most dangerous person that they know about, and they're going to associate with him now? You can understand why they would be uh, afraid. They also can understand, just because in, in human nature, most people don't change. <laughs> As they say, you know, leopards don't usually change their spots. And so they're, they're very afraid. Surely this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Surely uh, this is a double agent, and he's going to cross us. Just like every spy movie, you know, double agent. You, he's going to cross us, and then we're going to be caught in the crossfire, and it's just going to be a trap. Um, and they at first rejected him. Now before I move on in the story, let me pause and, and just remind you that the same thing goes on in our society and in the church today. You see, whenever a change takes place in a person's life, a major obstacle is often their past. Ask anyone who's been incarcerated, and they will tell you, yeah, in theory, people say, forgive and move on. But it is very difficult for people to move beyond others' past and allow them a new chance. Very difficult. They suspect that that person will continue to be as they have always been, and don't give them a chance. Don't even give God a chance, do you hear me? To change their lives. We've seen people, all of us, have become cynical because we've seen people say that they're going to change, say that they're going to turn over a new leaf, and it, the new leaf is just like the old leaf, right? And so we, we get cynical about that. Patterns in life are hard to change and hard to alter, and we look at suspicion with anyone trying to be a new creation in Christ, and maybe walking and stumbling and falling, as well, see, we told you that person didn't change. Like all of us changed like that. Like it wasn't a process with us. Like it isn't a process with us. Amen, right? And yet, we still put people off. In many cases, I'm sad to say that um, we, we just don't always give people a fair chance. Why? Because we want to play it safe. We don't want to take a risk on that person. What if that person falls back? What if, if, if <clears throat> others reject them, they'll reject me because I'm associating with them? You know, human nature, we, we worry about those things. And it gets in the way of God's work. We want to play it safe. And we find it hard to believe that God can make a person new. We know that God did it with us, but we're skeptical about it with someone else. 
But you know, I am so thankful and so pleased to point right now to Barnabas. Barnabas. Right here, verse 27, this man Barnabas, in a great act of faith and courage, he brought Saul to the apostles in Jerusalem. He said, this guy's okay. I'll stand with him. He stood beside Paul when others were afraid to do so. And I think that Barnabas is a tremendous example to us. I thank God for Barnabas. And I thank God for people that have been Barnabases in my life who stood by me in difficult times. If it weren't, think about it, if it weren't for Barnabas, would Paul be Paul today? He may not have even gotten a hearing with the, with the believers in Jerusalem and everything that followed after that might have all fallen in at that moment if Barnabas hadn't stepped in, if Barnabas hadn't been an advocate for Paul in that moment, if he hadn't been as courageous as he was in saying, no, I'll stand with this man. Son of encouragement, that's what the New Testament calls Barnabas, and that's exactly what he was to Paul in that moment. And again, I don't think we can always, not being back in that situation, grasp the enormity of what Barnabas did at that moment for Paul and for the church as a whole. Uh, imagine that a person responsible for the murder of one of your best friends, Stephen, right? Somebody that has murdered, overseen the murder of your best friend, is now coming in and wants to be one of in the inner circle? Think about it for a minute. It gives you pause. You know, what, what would be running through your head at that moment? What would you be thinking? What would you be saying? Would you be walking out the door the other direction? Those are things that we have to think about. But Barnabas did not. Barnabas was there for him. Why did Barnabas do it? Well, first of all, because the Lord spoke to his heart. Right? And we need to be listening to God. Not about what I want to do, but what God is asking me to do. Especially to stand along someone else. He saw the fruit in his life beginning to come out. Saul wasn't completely transformed, but he was in process and he was willing to stand with him. Maybe he believed God more than the others at that moment. To say, yes, God is capable of changing anyone in any circumstance at any time. And what matters most to me is that this man was, was, was touched by God and despite the risks, he stood with Paul. Um, you know, we think about Paul as a, as a mighty and, and fearless apostle of God. But you know what? At that moment, Paul had nothing. Everything that he had had been stripped away from him. He was this man of high standing in the religious community. All that was gone. His whole network of people was gone. You know, you talk to some people that have been drug dealers and have, have lived that kind of a life before, and they'll say, the problem is, I'm in this no man's land. I don't belong here, and I don't belong there, and I don't know what to do. I can't go back to my old friends, but I don't have any new friends. What do I do? That is the case. I, I, we don't see Paul. We don't think about Paul being vulnerable, but he was very vulnerable at that moment. And that's why Barnabas' example is so powerful to me, that he was willing to stand with Paul. You know, in a span of just uh, probably 10 days to two weeks, all of this had gone down. And without all the communication resources that we have in this world today, people were afraid of Paul. And yet, here he was, standing in for him. Then came Barnabas. And he saved the day for Saul. And what I want to challenge all of us today to is this. Are you willing to be a Barnabas? Are you willing to be a Barnabas for somebody today? Are you willing to gamble on a man or a woman 
maybe who has had a sketchy past. Are you willing? Are you prepared for disappointment? Are you still willing to stand with that person through ups and downs, through disappointments? What if that person doesn't turn over a new leaf? Are you still willing to try to stand with them, to encourage them in the faith? The truth is that all of us need Barnabases in our lives. And the truth is that God calls all of us to be a Barnabas for someone else. And again, that is the challenge today. Who is God calling you to be a Barnabas for today? We see examples in Scripture. We heard in the Old Testament about how um, Jonathan was a Barnabas for David. We know the story of how Ruth was a Barnabas for Naomi. And of course here, Barnabas being a Barnabas for Paul. It's hard to be a Barnabas sometimes. It takes a risk. It isn't always easy. And yet, the Lord calls us to be a Barnabas. Who is it in your life that you need to be a Barnabas for? Can you see them today? Can you see their face? Maybe it's a co-worker. Maybe it is a neighbor. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's the person that just started to work in the 7-Eleven down the street. Maybe it is your niece or your nephew. Maybe it's a teenager. Maybe it's a recently released inmate. Maybe an immigrant. You don't have to look far. I'm willing to bet that all of you have someone in your life right now that God is calling you to be a Barnabas for. My only challenge to you today is to figure out who it is. Who is the person that God is calling you to be a Barnabas for today? My prayer for all of us is that we would hear God's call to be a Barnabas and step out in faith and be that Barnabas for someone today. Amen? Amen. I hope you will take that challenge home with you today to prayerfully consider, say, Lord, who is it? Who is the person that I can be a Barnabas for today? And you know what? It may not take some great act of courage. It might just take a small one. Maybe it's just a call or a note. Maybe it's a visit. Maybe it's just a word of encouragement to say, don't give up, hang in there, or, you know, I'll drive you to that job interview, or whatever it is. But think about it. Pray about it. Be that Barnabas. As we conclude our service today, I want to encourage you to turn to hymn number 474, and we'll sing today, I Surrender All, 474.
Go forth now to be a blessing, to follow Jesus, and to act like Barnabas. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.